Welcome back for the final leg of the Berex Stakeholder Forum with a session on the DMA, a very timely session, I should say. Congratulations to the organizers for the timing. It's perfect. You know that tomorrow there is the Trilogue, the second meeting of the Trilogue on the DMA. And we've got a, 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 a wonderful lineup of speakers. We've got Andreas Schwab, member of the European Parliament and the rapporteur for the DMA. We have Michel van Billingen, who hardly needs an introduction in this, in this audience, Berek Chair, 2021, and we should have, I hope soon, <laughs> Professor Alexander Strail directly from New York City. Um, but let's see, let's see. What. Michel, let's start with you. You've been leading Barrex efforts on the DMA for the last, well, ever since the proposal was put on the table by the, by the Commission. Give us a, a recap of, uh, of the, the Barrex foray in this field so far. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Yes, uh, indeed, um, we have uh, done a lot of work during this uh, last one, one year and a half uh, on, on DMA. To start with our response to the public consultation, I see uh, Alexandre is joining. And, uh, of course, uh, an opinion uh, for a, a swift, effective, and uh, future uh, oriented uh, intervention, but also uh, a report on ex ante regulation and different papers on different topics, such as the uh, tailor made uh, remedies, the setup of an advisory board, and last but not least, the, the interplay uh, between the European Electronic Communications Code and the DMA on NIICS. I'll come to this uh, later, of course. We had a lot of outreach uh, with uh, stakeholders, to start with the co-legislators, with Mr. Schwab, uh, of course, uh, with uh, other members of Parliament, with uh, the Commission, uh, the, the Cabinet of Commissioner Breton, DG Connect, DG Comp, with uh, our counterparts in other bodies, such as uh, ERGA for uh, Media Regulator, RGP on Postal, EDPS on Data, uh, protection. Uh, we had also um, two, organized two workshops, one on um, market contestability and, uh, and another one on uh, consumer uh, protection uh, as well. So a lot of interaction with uh, stakeholders too. And um, the question could be, so why have we done that as Beric? Well, uh, if you look at our uh, vision statement, if you look at our um, high-level strategic priorities, the, the answer is quite obvious. Through this work, what we, we, we think is important is promoting contestability by um, um, actually uh, this, uh, ensuring this uh, inter-platform com competition we want to also to, um, to ensure fairness for a uh, business user by this uh, open digital market. And last but not least, uh, consumer protection. Consumer protection from what? From potential uh, abuses uh, due to this intermediation power of uh, gatekeepers. So, this is mainly the, the reason why it was uh, Im important for us to, to have this uh, work done. And of course, we also know, based on our long-standing uh, experience in the field of uh, electronic communications for the last 20 years, that when uh, DMA will finally uh, adopt, and I wish Mr. Schwab all the best of luck, of course, for, for his trilogue to, tomorrow, um, the game will not be over. It's only the beginning, like, like we had for, uh, for telcos. And, and we know that it will still be a long journey with a difficult discussion with, uh, I, I should say, some battles. We will st score victories, we will also lose battles, but that's, that's, the, way, that's the way it is. And for us, in, in this, um, the main important thing, and I, I think um, we, we can t totally be on the same line of the, the European Parliament, is the effective implementation, the enforcement. And that's the reason why we think that the European Commission cannot do the job alone. It's a question of resources, uh, of course, you know about these uh, 18 FTAs, but also uh, what we see is uh, that we are lacking a little bit this uh, local touch. Because uh, 
well, it, it will um, concern um, mainly uh, SME uh, business users and um, 10,000, about, uh, about 10,000 in, in Europe, and we need to speak the same language. We need to, have to lower the, the threshold. And that's what the reason why we have put forward this, this ID to involve the uh, national independent authorities to uh, assist the Commission. So don't get me wrong, we are very supportive to this uh, DMA initiative, but we think that the European Commission could uh, be helped and need some, some help for different reasons, just uh, um, data gathering or uh, market monitoring, but also to see uh, to uh, what extent uh, there is uh, compliance with the uh, obligations put, put in place, and also collect complaints to play a role in, in the um, dispute resolution mechanism. So, those are uh, the, main, the main reasons, and that's the reason why we are uh, v delighted to see that the European Parliament has put uh, this idea forward of a high-level group of digital regulators, be it um, competition authorities, and erase uh, data protection, or whatever. Because this, uh, this is the way to ensure uh, a harmonized implementation, to, to ensure uh, co and in this, uh, in this implementation. And this is based also on the, on the experience we have within uh, BEREC. So that's um, certainly um, a, a good way forward, uh, of course. What we miss a, a little bit, and uh, based on, again on, on our experience, is the, the tailor-made approach. And we think that's, that's a question of flexibility, proportionality, and also to be future-proof. Otherwise, you need to, to revise the, the regulation after, mm -hmm. after some, some years. But, but OK, that's, that's uh, where it stands. And uh, I will not avoid uh, the, the hot topic of interoperability and uh, what do we understand by, by this? Well, it's, uh, if you like, the possibility for two different systems to exchange information. And as we see, the, what we call the horizontal interoperability is about uh, getting people connected to using different platforms, different messaging uh, systems. And uh, the question is, is this the right place in the DMA to foresee that kind of interoperability, yes or not? So for that, I can refer to our uh, report uh, about the, the interplay between the, uh, the code on the one hand and, uh, and the DMA on the, on the other hand, where we stayed, uh, you, you probably remember in the code, uh, Article 61 states that if end-to-end -end connectivity is in danger, then, the, based on the assessment, then the European Commission may trigger a mechanism allowing NRAs to impose interoperability. And we think this is a very, very complex mechanism need, uh, which needs a thorough analysis. And we, we are ready to kickstart this, this exercise well, together with the, the Commission, uh, of course. And uh, so I think we better avoid what we would call regulatory overlap between uh, two, um, two, um, two rules, two, two regulatory frameworks. Just uh, to, to finish with uh, the, the, the work done so far, um, I would like to, to thank uh, the stakeholders for uh, their involvement during this last uh, 18 months, because all the work we have done is due to, of course, the excellent team we had within BEREC mm -hmm. to start with the co-chairs of EMEA group and, and the members of the, of the group and our colleagues within, within BEREC, but also the interaction we, we had with uh, our, our stakeholders. It helped us a lot, all the, the response we had to our public consultation, of course. And it's not over yet, because uh, as you probably know, um, this year on the work program, we will publish a draft report on an uh, internet ecosystem to have a kind of holistic approach, which is relevant of course, for telco operators on the one hand, but also for uh, digital platforms on, on the other end. And this will be published in June after uh, P2. And um, this will be my, my final word. We are happy. 
to uh, assist the Commission for the implementation of the DMA uh, from the very, very beginning. Thank you very much Thank for your you. attention. Thank you very much, Michel. Andrea Schwab, before perhaps diving into what is the subject of this session, the enforcement of the DMA, what everybody wants to know, of course, is your views on how things might go tomorrow. I think it's fair to say that compared to other legislative measures, the convergence between the Council and the Parliament text is already very large. I'm not saying that there are just a few minor problems to solve, but frankly, you, you, Council and Parliament agree on what, 90, 95% of the text, no? <laughs> So, but what, uh, what is your forecast on the remaining sticking point, on the wrinkles to be ironed out? Will, well, it, will you do that say? tomorrow? Will you do that tomorrow, or will there be a third meeting? No, but I mean, it's the fourth meeting already. Oh, fourth already. <laughs> it's okay. already the fourth meeting, so we are needing a, a lot of time uh, to meet, and we have met uh, in person again. So I'm very happy, first of all, that you have been able, uh, Mr. President, to convey this meeting in person again. Um, and it's my pleasure that I'm here, your guest, at the uh, in-person uh, stakeholder forum of Berwick. I'm very happy to see you all again in good health and good shape and full of ambition for further work. <laughs> um, and there will be further work uh, for everyone. Mm -hmm. So the, the, these trialogues um, have been extremely um, constructive so far. And uh, tomorrow we have, as you said, already the last one, um, it, which will be the fourth. There is for sure some sort of ambition also on the side of policymakers, not only on Barrack's side, because we also want to show that for that law that we have been waiting for so much time, that we want to close it soon so that it can be already in force in this parliamentary term and not only in the next one. Therefore, I think there is a lot of support also from other colleagues to make sure that we get it done uh, tomorrow. But I can't promise that here, but mm. I believe it's very likely to happen. And um, I would say that uh, you have already touched upon a few key concerns that will be discussed tomorrow. And that is for sure that um, idea that came into the DMA at a late stage uh, on interoperability, which is not really part of the DMA DNA, if I may uh, say it like that, because the DMA is rather a regulatory competition and internal market related piece of legislation and interoperability comes rather from the standardization, technical uh, part of, uh, of input. But for sure, the effect in the market might be similar. Therefore, we have been pushing for that. Um, the European Commission has been helpful, has always said that this is possible to be done. And therefore, now it's a bit unfortunate that we don't have a concrete proposal on how this can be done concretely because the key driver for this to happen was always that the group chats are an element where the gatekeeping position, the dominance, is, is strongest. So that was the key why we wanted to intervene. And there, apparently, for encryption reasons, we face now the biggest problems. And we won't be able to deliver immediately on um, interoperability if the Commission sticks to what they have been writing down. That is a bit unfortunate, and therefore we will have to to say we start with a limited approach on interoperability on number independent interpersonal communication services and we will try to uh, bring in um, group chats as quickly as possible afterwards. From, from, uh, from my perspective, all the other elements look rather a bit weird. No, the Commission is very clear that they won't be able to make them interoperable quickly. The Council is saying we don't want to, that they don't want to put it in the DMA and therefore I think it will on interoperability and uh, with number independent interpersonal communication services. That, is, that would be for sure a strong yeah. tool. In the end, however, it will uh, remain to be seen how concrete users will use, you will be able to use it uh, concretely. And, and that is something that you will have to check. The second element is something um, on which you also have some, uh, some knowledge. There is that concern, and which is not only a concern, which is even proven, that tracking data and using personal data is something which is done in a much broader manner than normal users are aware of. And secondly, it's even done against GDPR. So it's even done in an unlawful, illegal manner. Have consumers, have users the choice? Yes. Do they exert it? Not really. Therefore, with the DMA, we want for sure not only 
care about the combination effects of data with the gatekeeper's login effects and um, um, multiplication mm -hmm. possibilities, but we also want to make sure that the GDPR principles are again brought into respect on that basis. Is it because of the gatekeepers having most of the data? No, it's because of the combination effects being most important with gatekeepers. Therefore, here we have to make sure that GDPR rules are finally really respected. And therefore, that will be important. And we don't want that to be an, an ongoing story. We want that to be limited in time, that uh, the consent under GDPR can only be asked once per year. We will see what the Council will propose tomorrow, maybe twice per year, but not every day. Mm. Because that is for sure a bit the trigger of gatekeepers by saying, but if you ask for too much of consent, then we will ask consumers every day and then they will fed up. No. <laughs> we have clearly said there will be a limit yeah. and you have to adapt your consent policy to this limit. They are not so happy about that, but I think it's an important step to make sure that consumers can seriously think about when taking the decision. And the third element is for sure a bit... Um, the whole other stuff around governance, future-proofing, um, and making the DMA a tool that is also fit for purpose in competition policy terms. Now, on the governance which you are most interested in, um, you know that I have always, when I introduced that high-level group of experts, um, high-level expert group, I think it's called, that for sure we need competition policy enforcement. But competition policy enforcement is um, not the only reflection that we need here. We need a very strong set of European um, authorities that oversee the market or even the markets and that can contribute to make it a, an interconnected regulation, the DMA, that really fixes the problems where they arise as soon as possible. And for that reason, I think it's very good that more or less this is also accepted. Uh, this has been an important, with all the modesty I have for my own work, an important enlargement of the DMA because it has also set a bit a, a broader acceptance uh, within the, the, um, the existing schemes. And therefore, I'm very happy that this has been accepted. And therefore, coming back on your question, how does it look like, it's true that in the European Union there is a strong commitment of the Parliament, of the Commission, and of the Council to make the DMA work. And I had just a phone call with Commissioner Vestager, and obviously, I mean, in the end, I think no one will be able to be against the DMA. Is it so easy? No, because the DMA has to be fit for purpose. First of all, it has to be a tool that can easily, easily be used. Secondly, it has to be a tool which remains in place even if it might be challenged more quickly in court than a lot of people think. And it has also to be a bit open for the future. I have always been defending that we should focus at the beginning on the biggest problems in the market. And the biggest problems with gatekeepers are the biggest gatekeepers. And it's like that even though some may mislead that argument by saying this is uh, anti-whatever. It's just a focus with the number of people that are at our disposal on the key problems. And I have the impression that that will be accepted. In any event, I will fight for it. Um, and we also want to be able to use all the tools that are theoretically in our hands, not to threaten anyone, but to be very clear that when we want to enforce European law, we will use all the tools that we have to do so. And there will be no one um, being excluded from it. Also here, therefore, I believe that structural behavioral measures also did the, the, the ban on, on acquisitions for a, time, uh, yeah. for a given time will be in the toolbox um, if there is systematic non-compliance. And with all that, I would say that the cooperation with the French presidency has been extremely professional, has been extremely uh, competent, very good. Um, and they have to look for majorities in between 27 member states, which is not always easy. You, you know it yourself that also in Berec you don't have always the same positions. And we have to look for a majority within the European Parliament. And I think the Commission, they will have a majority. Um, um, no, this is a little joke. But, um, <laughs> uh, but that's our task, and I think we will fulfill it, and we will manage it. And therefore, I think it's rather more interesting for you than to ask specific questions on, on choice yes. screens and all the details yeah. that I will not outline here, because it might be yeah. a bit too, no, th too general. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you so much. And we'll, we'll come back to you on the, the DMA as an easy-to-use tool uh, uh, in a minute when we come back. Let's, let's now go to New York. Good morning, Alexandre. 
Uh, great Hello, to have you. you. You all know Alexandre, of course, who has been doing a lot of work in the last two years on, on the DMA. Let, with you, Alexandre, let's move a little bit more on what you think of the enforcement of the DMA. Will it be easy to enforce? Yeah. No. No, it will not be easy. So, uh, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. So I, I am in uh, New York, in fact, for the year because I wanted to understand what is the U.S. strategy with big tech. And you know, when you are in the U.S., you are, you demystify a little bit the U.S. because I think at least what we have in Europe is a clear strategy. While here we um, here in the U.S. we we don't have it. So that's why I'm not with you, unfortunately. But um, but uh, I think it's important to to see that on a on a global stage. So um, I think the DMA will be extremely difficult to 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 enforce. It will be probably one of the most difficult law um, that the EU has adopted uh, uh, to to enforce for for different reasons. First, it's a new law. Uh, it's a new field, and and as uh, for, for for those old enough to remember the liberalization of telecom, I mean, it was not easy when you when you do a new a new field, and it's also a new role for the Commission. You know, it's the first time that the Commission will become a regulatory authority. So, I mean, we should not um, underestimate the learning curve. Um, the second thing is, it's an extremely complex sector. Something are understood, others are less well understood. So that make the thing uh, complicated. And uh, the rules themselves are not always uh, uh, very easy. They are complex because the sector is complex. And they go sometimes at the heart of the business model of the big tech. So you could expect a, a strong resistance because um, it goes uh, uh, against uh, some of the core of their business model. So, you know, um, I think self-execution, because we speak a lot about self-execution, for me, self-execution is a myth, you know, do not exist. Uh, and do not exist in digital. And if you want to be convinced about that, uh, you have to look at how the black clothes in the consumer protection have been enforced or are enforced uh, against the big tech. And it's a complex process. You know, sometimes it takes uh, two years be, uh, of uh, uh, negotiation of discussion between the big tech and the consumer protection agencies just to enforce a uh, clause which are supposed to be uh, self-enforcing. So I think it will be extremely complex. I also think that the DMA will probably lead to a constant and deep oversight of some big tech, you know, and that um, the, the tech regulation which is about to be adopted will evolve towards a kind of banking regulation. You know? And so um, I think that it will not be like in competition law, which is a sort of eat and run a strategy of the agency. You know, you, 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 you come when there is a problem in the market and then you leave. Here, I think, you will need a constant and deep oversight of the firm. So that is, you know, putting us in the uh, regulatory uh, environment and not the competition environment, regulatory environment that um, uh, Berek knows very well. So uh, what does it mean in practice? It means that the Commission, of course, will have the key role. Uh, the Commission will, if you want, um, orchestrate, we need to orchestrate an ecosystem of enforcement. So in a way, the Commission will become, a, 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 will also develop a, a kind of ecosystem if you want. So the Commission will be at the center and it's very important that we have a good cooperation between the different Commission services, DG Comp, DG Connect in particular. And it's also very important that there is enough people, but also that those people have a kind of a geek culture, you know, and um, the Commission is a bureaucratic institution like every administration and, and that's normal, that's good. But I think they will, it will, the Commission will have to evolve uh, like a, a less bureaucratic and more uh, geek. And I think that is a kind of a cultural revolution which, which won't be easy. And the Commission will not be uh, uh, able to do that alone, as the, the previous speakers have said. Um, it will have to involve and have a, a close dialogue with um, the regulated gatekeeper, obviously, with um, the complementer and the competitor of those regulated gatekeeper. And it's very important that they are involved in particular in the remedy design and sometimes more than what has been the case, for instance, in some antitrust case, because, I mean, there has been several antitrust cases against the big tech, but one of the weak points beyond the fact that it was slow, but I think that's not the worst problem. The, the worst problem is that very often the remedy imposed have not been effective enough. And why they have not been effective enough, there are several reasons, but probably one of them is that um, the, the discussion uh, with all the uh, complementer and the competitor in the remedy design 
was not deep enough. And I think it will be very important that in implementing the DMA, um, that discussion is deep enough. And then, of course, the national authority. Um, and there, I, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Andreas Schwabs has said. I mean, and, 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 and uh, Michel van Bellingen, it's very important that uh, not only the competition authority are involved, national competition authority, but also the regulatory authority, because they have experience in regulation. And so, um, and to finish uh, with uh, Berek, I think Berek has a very important role to play and plays a very important role already, as Michel has recalled, but on two things. One is on, uh, of course, uh, the number independent interpersonal communication services, because there is a clear overlap, independently of the interoperability discussion, uh, between uh, the DMA and the uh, um, uh, electronic communication code. But I think beyond, because um, beyond the, the, the services which are under the competence of uh, the National Regulatory uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority, uh, also for the other digital services, which are not directly uh, uh, under the competence of the, uh, of the telecom regulators, but for which the telecom regulator have an experience, you know, in ensuring interoperability, in ensuring access to platform and data. So I really hope that um, the, the European Commission will take the invitation that um, um, Michel uh, gave uh, of using the expertise which is around to design the remedy in a way uh, which is good. Because, you know, at the end of the day, the Commission will be under strong pressure to deliver in short time frame. And I personally think that the time frame are a little bit too tight for some obligation which are extremely complicated. But um, I think it's it's better to discuss at the beginning in this short time frame that not discussing because the time frame is too tight and then having a lot of problem and revisiting the remedy as we have seen in the Google shopping case and in the Google Android case, where I think there has been several iteration of the remedy which shows the difficulty, but which is also showing that it's better to discuss very deeply first instead of uh, waiting uh, for the second iteration of the remedy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alexandre. Uh, Andreas, you, you heard Alexandre, no, don't dream about a self-execution. We're going to, big tech is going to be some, become some sort of a banking regulation, very complicated, very sophisticated. Is this strengthening your resolve to push for the high-level group of digital regulator that you, you proposed? Are you ready to fight? No, but for sure we are ready to fight <laughs> and we have already been fighting. But um, I think we have to also be realistic. If um, this law will be uh, voted, there will be, let's say, uh, some 10, 15 um, elements for gatekeepers to be respected, enacted and implemented. And uh, given the variety of directions, that's not something that you do in a, in, in a, in a minute. You have to prepare this. You have to get it right because the penalties that we associate to it are very tough. So therefore, I think um, we should also give a credit uh, now for the enactment and for the implementation. And we should look with some sort of, when it's done, uh, with some sort of satisfaction on what has been achieved. That's not an easy fruit uh, to be used. This is a, a tool that really needs attention. For that reason, I think obviously it's very helpful if all the regulatory authorities in the area work together. Um, no one is pushing too much and uh, everyone is reflecting how it can be done best. Um, it's clear that we need a very strong cooperation in between authorities and we need also more people in the uh, authority that has to uh, uh, implement the rules, which is the European Commission. And um, uh, therefore, the first fight for a good law is just about to finish. The next fight will be how this will be to be then uh, enforced. And that cannot be done from my point of view with only 20 uh, persons. We need at the Commission some data analysts, uh, lawyers, economists to make this a reality because we also want to um, enforce it in time so that we can avoid the negative consequences that Alexandre has mentioned that we had been facing with competition policy cases that have taken far too long. So it's a real challenge um, and we should uh, try our best to face the challenge. Thank you, thank you. And, uh, is there a question from the room? I've got to do this to spot them, none. Uh, ah yes, please, Paolo from Etno, please. 
Can we have a mic here, please? We are not yet used to no. in-person meetings again. <laughs> Can, could we please have... Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Here, the gentleman. Raise your hand. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks a lot for the update and uh, also considerations. I would like to go back to uh, maybe one point that was raised by uh, Michelle on interoperability. Um, and uh, it's a question maybe for Alexander that has a long uh, experience in analyzing uh, measures in, in the tech sectors. And uh, I was wondering, uh, this push on interoperability uh, in the digital sector, but also on portability as a way to promote alternatives and the shift to, uh, of customers possibly to smaller alternatives and, and hopefully European alternatives. Um, is it going, uh, in your views, uh, to only have a positive uh, impact or uh, is there a risk that more interoperability, more portability uh, may also give way for big tech to find strategies to in fact cannibalize customers and uh, uh, leverage on more interoperability to, to in fact uh, undermine their competitors, uh, which is the unintended uh, effect. Thank you. Ale it's for Alexandre, right? you said. Yeah, Alexandre, please go. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um, as, I, as I have the, the screen in a way, I also want to say that, um, uh, to, to come back on a point that Andreas made about cooperation, I think it's very, very important. And I think, again, in banking regulation, we have a good model of cooperation in banking supervision with the joint investigation team, which are set up uh, between the ECB, which is, if you want, the equivalent of the commission for the DMA, and the National uh, Financial Supervisory Authority. And it seems to work relatively well. And so I think that maybe that could be an inspiration for organizing this model cooperation, which is the next step. On interoperability, um, I think that, um, yes, maybe you, you I, I think overall it's good to open the platform and to ensure this interoperability. Now, whether it will benefit uh, only the big and not the small, like for instance, some are, uh, are saying about the GDPR, um, or I am not sure, because the GDPR is a, is a, is a rule which is, um, uh, which is symmetric, so which applies to big and small. Here, the fact that it's only applied to, to the big one, so the uh, obligation are the big one and the right are for the small one, I think will uh, uh, be an, a way to alleviate this um, problem that we, we have or that has been now documented with the GDPR. Thank, thank you, Alexandre. On Andreas, can I, can please, I make a comment? Sure, 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 please because, go. I mean, we are um, definitely very much concerned on how digital markets have been, let's say, jeopardized by the market dominance of the gatekeepers. And that is something that we want to fix. But at the same time, we also have to see that in the last 10 years, telecom markets in the US have been going up by 30%, and in Europe, minus, I think, 29, I don't know the... But it's more or less a figure which has exactly the same development upwards in the US that we have in Europe downwards. Now, is it um, useful for consumers how we have been creating the market? Yes. Is it attractive for companies to invest? No. So we have also to fairly, not superficially, rethink what we can do better to create incentives to invest in Europe. In the telecom market, I would say again. In the digital market, I would say finally. So we need regulation, we need strong rules, but we need also a lot of flexibility that investment is done in Europe. And on that, I think we have not given maybe enough thought in the last time. That just to be added to what Alexandra has said. No. On, on this business of number independent ICS, during the day, we had a number at coffee breaks, informal conversation among economists on whether it was pro-competition or whether it would reinforce the dominant position of those in place. And opinions varied, you know, on the one hand, on the other. In, the opi in your opinion, or the opinion of the parliament, is it clear that mandating interoperability of, of NIICS would boost competition, would create more competition to, uh, to the gatekeeper platform? Or, 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 or no? We haven't done any impact assessment. This is an amendment uh, of, of political uh, groups and colleagues. Yeah. Um, and obviously, there is a fair concern with, you know, in the kindergarten, the parents group uh, on, on one company, all the time the same company, 
but I won't mention it now. Uh, the football club's team, the parents' team, whatever. It's always <laughs> the same. And if you are not part of that ecosystem, you cannot access. So you have to be there. Is that a gatekeeping position? Is it a bottleneck? Absolutely. Will there, and that's the key question now, will there be other companies wanting to use the open APIs of that company? I doubt. Uh, let's take some examples. I mean, Trema has its own business model. You pay even five euros for the, for the download. They won't, surely they won't do that. They have no interest. Yeah. Will uh, Signal try to do it? Probably not, because they will lose attraction for people to change. So um, what is the most likely outcome? That a newcomer that has not yet an NIICS will want to come into that market and want to absorb that possibility that uh, regulation will offer. Uh, I think that's fair. We shouldn't complain. But it's exactly linking to the point that I made. That, that will be rather, again, uh, a one curve that goes down for investment in Europe and another one going up in the US. I sh think we should not complain. There is an issue to be fixed here. But this sort of interoperability can only be done if there is a real market failure. And on these group chats, I think there is a market failure. And for that reason, it's so uh, um, said that the commission about that point seems not to be able to be able to deliver at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Andreas, there is a question from Anna Bigot, who just left the meeting before you arrived, but she begged me to ask you the following question. TF1, the French TV channel, and she says, you had a very interesting amendment whereby social network would have to validate the audience numbers by an independent third party, by Nielsen or whatever, huh? to, so that the, the audience figure that they communicate to advertisers are, are, are true. Is this something that you standing by, uh, you will be standing by tomorrow? Absolutely. What we want to do, and that was a personal concern for me, is to make these markets again um, competitive. Um, and that can only work if there is a much better insight in these markets. And for that reason, especially in the market on advertising, we need much more transparency. And that, I think it's Article 61G, we will create it. <laughs> but we will not only do that, we will also uh, place in Article 5A uh, the combination effects. And also there, there will be a, a need for more uh, transparency. Yeah. And uh, if we manage then also to have some stuff on uh, fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory in Article 61K, there is a set of rules that can have a massive effect. Now, can it be done automatically? Probably not that easily. There is some sort of guidance of the Commission being needed. But if that is done, for sure, there will be a, 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 an opening of a market that so far is foreclosed. And therefore, we have to make sure that those companies that are there from the US, from Europe, and from wherever in the world, that they invest to use that opening that will be there in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Good luck tomorrow. And please join me in thanking our great panelists. Uh